So, good morning, everybody. Good morning. We are we are online. I think we are, you are watching to us. You are hearing to us today. I have the the great pleasure to interview one of the greatest landscape photographers in the world. Who doesn't know Enrico Fossati? 
one of the pioneers, uh, for sure, of the pictorial landscape photography that is so common today between all, all of us, uh, a master, a real master in the treatment of light, in the dark mood, and a photographer about our whom for her friend Ryan Dyer told that uh, he was for him one of the best photographers in the world, probably the photographer that he surprises the most. So Enrico, thank you very much for wanting to be with us today to chat for a while and tell us something about your photographic philosophy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very you much, very Enrico. Much. Thanks to you, Ivan. I'm, I'm very happy. I'm so proud to be here. So thank you for invitation. Uh, I, thanks for the huge compliments. Uh, Ryan is always very kind <laughs> in, yeah. in uh, describing my photography. Uh, but definitely is a good guy. And my esteem uh, is in, in his work is great too, because I, I think probably he set uh, one of the biggest trends and on the web nowadays, especially for what concerning the, the composition. Uh, yeah. I, you, you can still see in, on the web thousands of pictures with huge flowers. <laughs> so it, it set a, a trend that is continuously yeah. very it is continuously very appreciated by people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you are going to have fun also today with with uh, there are a lot of people uh, that will be in the stream. Uh, there are a lot of trolls in this <laughs> in these uh, streams. I have now yeah. one, one of our friends that it is telling us that you have the perfect white balance in your camera. You are the master. I don't have the white balance, <laughs> correct? So uh, I'm going to 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 do some some questions. And I don't have prepared too much, uh, too much questions because I want uh, to give people the chance to ask uh, something if they want. So I just have prepared 20 questions to share with all our followers. And of course, you will be sharing uh, at some time the, your screen in order to show us some PSD files. So I'm going to start uh, with a question I, I have prepared for, for you. I think that uh, if today, if we think about uh, about Enrico Fossati, those photographs with a dark mood, uh, with uh, comes to our minds. Photos where you play with the darkness, with shadows, with drama, but also with a realistic style in the landscape you are you are representing. How did you get to this style? What led you to this type of photography of the this dark mood uh, and this? this epic photography? Well, uh, this journey started many years ago. And uh, I remember when I started to to study, to develop my personal style about photography, uh, the world of landscapes was uh, totally ruled by images with um, fiery skies and crimson auroras. It, it was everything very colorful very saturated and uh, at the time especially in europe in south, in southern europe uh, there was nobody uh, processing picture in a certain way because there was only a few photographers in the world that were able to 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 edit picture in, in a certain way so i started to, to think how to improve my skills and the problem that at the time would be the tutorials and Skype processing sessions were, were not something that was possible to do. And so I started to study of my own a lot of softwares and, and programs. And then uh, at the time there was the, the dawn of the luminosity masking. I remember at the beginning there, was, there wasn't the panel or the automation. There was just yeah. like a huge manual with a lot of description and of the tools, how to do that, how to do that. Yeah. So it was pretty complicated. And um, the reason of why of the dark processing or dark mode, the dark mode is just a, a friendly name that people have started to, to call that kind of processing. But in origin, that, that name is born from, uh, it was like a commercial name because yeah. uh, I was trying to do something different and uh, I was looking for a name that was pretty nice. So I decided to publish my first video back in 2016, Dark Processing and Mastering the Mode. And, and people 
uh, has created a, a new name that is Dark Mood, <laughs> based on that. Anyway, the reason of that, that kind of processing is, but besides my personal taste, that of course is, you know, I am a passionate about yeah, uh, about landscape kind of, photography, uh, yeah, landscape, but also art and movies. So definitely, I try to approach my picture in in a little more cinematic way since the beginning. Even at the time, I, I I wasn't very skilled, but I I was trying to do something personal. And um, I changed my mind about the, the way of processing and especially about the subject uh, when I, I started to, to visit uh, very often the French Alps. Mm -hmm. uh, in the French Alps, the weather is not very, uh, especially, well, in the re recent year, weather is changing. But like 10 years ago, it was uh, very rainy. Uh, very often, it was possible to yeah. to stumble in heavy thunderstorm and, and misty days. And uh, I was totally in love for that kind of atmosphere that was more like yeah. uh, Scotland or Iceland than uh, the, the the classical mountain shots that we that I was seeing on the forums because at the time social media were not uh, were at, at their beginning. So the the, the main platform especially here in Italy, uh, were forums and uh, everybody were going in, in the Dolomites shooting this <laughs> colorful sunset. And uh, I was thinking, I thought, damn, I, I can't, I can't uh, take this kind of colors in my area. Why? And then in the end, uh, I started to, to develop a, a, different, a different style that was uh, compliant with the weather conditions mm -hmm. and uh, was passionate about certain kind of things, definitely it has been a natural evolution. And everything probably started in 2014 mm -hmm. with the release of one of my most popular uh, pictures that is published in, the, in my masterclass uh, that I released in, in 2020. That is the, the first shot, Dashen to Rivendell. Uh, that shot has started um, the beginning of the of the career, of the career of the evolution of the dark processing. It, hmm. I edited that picture back in 2014. And uh, from that moment, I, I try to, to keep on going that visual style. And I continuously uh, exercise myself uh, to develop my own vision, uh, feeding my creativity, watching movies, art books, paintings, and uh, every time that I'm visiting an area, now I have a different idea how to manage the conditions, the composition, uh, I think is the lifeblood of my work. Yeah. Without that uh, creative approach, probably I would get tired in, in, a few, in a few moments because it is something that is totally exciting for me. In fact, you have been talking about the about the weather conditions, uh, and if we look uh, to your portfolio, you are we are going to to see that uh, you don't have uh, w photographers like 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 us often complains about we don't have when we don't have a good sky. We all want a sky on flames, uh, the hell in the earth, a red sky, and then everything is easy. It's very beautiful. It's very it's very easy to take pictures in those conditions. But if we analyze your gallery, I think that there are very few photos where you have colorful skies, very, very few pictures where you have a sky with color. Uh, so uh, for you, what is more important, light or color? How do you manage in the, the, the color of your images? Well, definitely I prefer, uh, I'm more interested in the lighting uh, okay. is that the colors, because colors of course are beautiful. And when we are able to capture a crimson sky during a, a nice walk, uh, especially in the mountains, it, it's very rewarding, but it's also very rare. And uh, you have to consider that many, many locations, especially in the Alps, are not very suitable for that kind of landscape. So very, very often uh, the weather, uh, when you find also a crimson sky in the Alps, um, maybe the valley is completely black. So you don't have any color in the, in the valley because maybe are 
very narrow and deep valley where uh, the best conditions maybe are in, in, in the middle of the afternoon. And uh, moreover, I believe that the drama that you can have in, in the middle of the afternoon with the proper lighting, I think is much better than, the, than a crimson sky. Well, then depends, of course, by the personal taste. But for me, sometimes it's better. Yeah. For you, it's, of course, uh, I think you, you, you have the same opinion, like Matt Peter Iverson, that bad weather, it's good weather. Well, bad weather, of course, it, it is giving you more chances to, to capture a nice picture compared to the classical uh, sunny day that people is enjoying for, for a pleasant stroll in the Alps. But when it's raining, especially when the sun is, the sun is going uh, up and down, is appearing and then is appearing, maybe it's raining or uh, the mist is rising. I think the drama and especially the transitions that are going to be naturally created in 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 the landscapes are uh, much much better and are giving a lot of interest in the scene is more vivid and uh, i think you you can i'm i mean sometimes watching certain kind of condition i see a story um i believe that watching a, a landscape uh, maybe during a rainy day Tell me something more compared to a normal, beautiful red sky. Maybe, uh, I don't know, probably because I'm, I spend a lot of time in the, in the mountains and uh, the, the experience of traveling or just walking in, in the mountains mm. uh, during the right. bad weather day is a fantastic experience. Yes. Uh, and you feel yourself alive you 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 can see the you can feel the um, the conjunction with nature and yeah. uh, definitely looking at certain kind of imaginary i i feel more excited and more yeah uh, interested in this kind of uh, and, pro uh, and probably you have more more chances to do pictures along all the day because if it is cloudy it's easier because of the light that you don't have a, a hard light so oh yeah it, yeah good weather bad weather it's good weather like Matt Peter Iverson say and uh, uh you have told some I think you have told a lot of times that you are a strongly spy inspired by scenes by Tolkien Uh, oh, yeah. What other influences do you have already from other photographers, not just Tolkien, the, the books or the writers, filmmakers? In fact, we are seeing that you have also began to publish another style of photographs that could be pl classified in Instagram like mate painting. Well, uh, well, this is quite a, <laughs> a complicated discussion. I mean, for what concerning the photographers I esteem, There are many guys that personally uh, I love their their approach to photography, especially um, I mean photographers that are going to research something unique, because I the, the essence of landscape photography is to admire something that is decontextualized. I don't know if this is the the proper word in English because of course it's not my primary language, but. Uh, what I mean is that uh, for me it's exciting when I see a scene that is not exactly uh, predictable. I mean, wow, this is amazing. Where is this place? It, it's beautiful. I can see something that is exciting. Of course, uh, I admire pictures of famous and popular location with the same interest, especially for uh, capturing the proper way. But the, the, the experience of um, seeing something new makes me more uh, interested. And um, for the authors that for me are uh, inspiring in the world of landscape photography, well, uh, I think Mark Adams probably, is, yeah. it has been my first love <laughs> and I continue to esteem his, his work uh, as explorer, as charismatic photographer, And yeah, uh, I, it's great what he's doing and is, is still active and uh, absolutely yep. original uh, since 25 years and, and is not is not a joke. 
and um, and then uh, of course I asked him, for example, Ryan Dyer, uh, yeah, um, Alex Noriega. Of course, now I, he, Alex is less active; is, has changed a bit. Yeah. His uh, personal style is doing more intimate photography, but mm -hmm. for me, is always uh, a great author. That yeah. I, I love it. And uh, well, from about European photographers, uh, for example, I like uh, Alexander Deschamps. There are other French photographers that I like that are uh, um, doing photography, especially on the Alps. And uh, then uh, I think one of the well, photographer is just something limiting as word well for this guy. But I love a lot. Uh, Michael Karkt is a, a He's a graphic designer from Poland, and uh, his website is mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the world. And I think he uh, is one of the best Photoshopper that, in my opinion, is doing landscape because are not the classical um, cartoon style matte painting photography. His works mm -hmm. are so intense, so deep, very, very cinematic, and uh, I feel something special when watching his works. And definitely a great artist. In my opinion mm -hmm. these are the people that I, I mostly esteem but there are many that now I, I i can't remember and then of course there are painters uh, painters yeah. are a great source of inspiration for me um and for um, what concerning the, the matte painting i think uh for me are a, a fantastic um chance to evolve my personal style and experiment with new things. Uh, it's not just a matter of creating uh, pictures uh, with random clip arts or things that you can find on the web, because uh, to, to create certain images, especially if you want to approach it with a style that is more um, recognizable and is more um linked to the traditional world of photography i mean for example if you want to make a, a mate painting with an extreme perspective like a an ultra wide angle do you need to go on the place and shoot the foreground of your own for example because it is very complicated to find certain kind of subject on the micro stock websites so you yeah. need to go in the field with an idea capture the elements that you that yeah. you need to to compose your image it's very difficult yeah it is challenging definitely but i my opinion is uh, definitely rewarding uh, some people is uh, a follower it's asking to us that uh he are he deeply admires your your images your landscape images but you are not going to 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 give to give up about landscape photography you are going to all you will always be you will be doing landscape photography you are not going to change to matte painting you will be always a landscape photographer well um, i think that the word landscape photographer uh, is just a tag i mean um i consider myself a creator and uh the the, the genre of my my genre is definitely landscape photography it is the thing for that I, I I changed a little my life because people is uh, knowing me as a landscape photographer but I always uh, mentioned in my biographies that I'm also an image maker because landscape photography is a concept that is linked to the world of traditional photography and in my opinion uh, is just obsolete as a concept because all the photography that we see on Instagram from 19% of the popular Instagrammers by far more popular than me are all of these pictures are a kind of matte painting because yeah. there aren't natural pictures. There are a lot of composites element about lights, foreground rocks. Maybe people can notice them, but if you are in the business and you have your eye trained, you can see these kind of things very clearly. And sometimes these kind of attempts are that are masked behind uh, a nice tale written in the description 
is somehow ridiculous because you can you can see that it is barely fake but I, I don't have nothing to say about that uh, I mean it, it, it is right uh, it's just the natural evolution of landscape photography is this is not I do not consider this as um, like a a documentaristic photography. Mm -hmm. This is fine mm -hmm. art photography yeah. and um, blending a subject in a scene that could be a medieval ruin, a tree or a person is exactly the same that blending a flower. I, it, it doesn't change nothing. It's just the, yeah. the, 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 the concept that is yeah. changing. So if you want to do documentaristic photography, you have to uninstall Photoshop from your PC and you have just to get out with your camera and take your picture. And then if you start to change the colors, change the things and moving the objects inside the scene, yeah. that is matte painting. <laughs> it's yeah, just of course, art. yes, and it's the uh, same. Yeah, This is my opinion, of course. Yeah. Uh, your work always, uh, it, your work is always uh, it always has a very recognizable style, but it's also very varied. You have pictures of forests, seascapes, landscapes. You have all kinds of images, waterfalls, mountains, mountains. You have castles, you have rivers. You have a lot of different places to take pictures. Where do you enjoy the most? What is your favorite site or your favorite type of type of photography where do you feel most comfortable well probably my comfort zone is between the mountain and the forest <laughs> the area in the mid because i love to spend such a, so much time in usually when i when i select a place where to to shoot my own picture um I always try to find the, um, a B plan. I mean, I love to have in an area where it can take a, a nice sunrise and at the same time I can move in the forest and take kind of different shots. But probably shooting forest and streams is something that is very relaxing for me because I, I don't have uh, any rush for what's concerning the lighting. And I can, I can just mm, move my in the forest and, and fly with the imagination trying to to compose new and original pictures uh, it, it's truly stimulating for me yeah and we all know that uh, you are not uh, somebody who usually takes uh, pics of the typical postcard image of a well-known place you are able to to see details always in places where perhaps a lot of us won't, won't be able to see anything. You are always mixing natural frames, lights, shadows. Uh, but is there a place where it might be more difficult for you to find something that works? Perhaps in the boots where it's always more chaotic to, to, to achieve a good composition? Oh, yes, definitely. There are places that are more challenging. Probably the forest is not the most challenging for me because mm -hmm. in the forest, I mean, if the, the kind of environment is nice, the kind of forest, I mean, there are nice trees and nice details. You can always find something to shoot. I think it's more complicated if you are maybe hiking up on the top of a mountain where you don't have nice conditions, you don't have nothing special uh, to use to compose your scene i mean you don't have anything you don't have flowers you don't have trunks you don't have stones you have just the mountains around you and maybe a lighting that is not exactly interesting that is always challenging for me uh, in fact uh, when there are that kind of days sometimes i just okay i i'm i'm enjoying the mountains and i, I shut down my camera <laughs> By, by the way, I have this this picture about, I think this uh, this man who is in the picture is Javier de la Torre. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for, for this image, I, I think you use liquify, no? Liquify because he, I, I'm watching two feet here. Uh, <laughs> this is such a bad statement. It was in perfect shape. 
I think he was with the his stomach. He he can breathe. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> actually, uh, sorry. He, he was posing for the for the guys. Yeah. Uh, we were on, on tour in Iceland. It has been a fantastic trip, and uh, Javier did a, a, an awesome job with the guys because most of the guys were speak only Spanish, and I wasn't mm -hmm. able to to follow them uh, at one hundred percent. So I, I was just taking the snapshots behind them, and I, I was shooting with the four hundred millimeters, and yeah. I found this silhouette of Javier. Yeah, <laughs> so I think. Bad. I think the ti the title of this image was crowned by the stars or something like that, no? Yes, because there are yeah. all the stars above his head. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful a beautiful image and also the reflection in his flat stomach. <laughs> it's it's also great the light. <laughs> all the silhouette it's it's with the light. So, analyzing also your compositions there is something that uh, I really love. I, I really love, and uh, I'm I'm looking for something here. Wait a moment. Yes, a lot of your images. It's like a three uh, the three D effect, three D three dimensionality. They are not limited as it is often to do to a powerful far foreground and something in the background. There are like three planes. There is a transition zone that leads you from the foreground to the background. As we can see in these images, you have the foreground, the transition, and the and the end of the image. Like this one, you have this, this, uh, these branches, this, uh, the middle and the, and the end of the picture. All, in a lot of your images, we can find this, always a transition zone. Is this uh, something common to you? How much time do you spend studying an image? A composition before pressing the shutter. Oh well, I'm I'm quite well. First of all, thank you for the appreciation. Uh, uh, I'm so glad you are enjoying my efforts in finding uh, this kind of composition. That, uh, on the other hand, doing this work it, for me is so rewarding. But on the commercial side, not exactly as expected. I mean, uh, probably if I was in my wide angle to shoot flowers, yeah. giant. It would be yeah. easier for me to 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 collect likes and followers, but that is not the kind of landscape I'm looking for, because uh, this kind of composition has deep roots that are not exactly uh, only in landscape photography, but are the concept that are coming through uh, through us thanks to the to the classical paintings. If you are looking for um, the paintings of maybe mm -hmm. other Yes, that Thomas Cole and a lot of, of romantic painters. You can see mm -hmm. this kind of elements, this kind of transitions that are creating certain kind of three dimensionality, even yeah. if you don't have a strong foreground. I think that is the key for creating a, a scene that is more considered a landscape because uh, when I look at, for example, a movie, I, I see this, for example, just uh, looking for the concept art of video games or movies. I, I collect a lot of books of that kind, and uh, you always have this kind of transition. I spend uh, quite a bunch of time in studying and developing my ideas about the composition. In fact, um, when I'm shooting in the Alps, uh, is always challenging and uh, for example uh, when I am with other persons maybe they are excited of shooting a place and they are seeing me just walking up and down and moving because I, I'm <laughs> never happy about the composition I'm very picky about that and uh, I take a, a lot of time I I'm used to to move on the location uh, possibly uh, at least two or three hours before the sunset because I need to scout the location uh, at my best. Yeah, I that was the question I was going to do uh, right now, because you have told to us now that you go uh, usually two or three hours before the sunset in order to, to look for the best to the rest to the best composition. It's really uh, uh, people must know that it is always uh, necessary to go 
a lot of time before in order to do that scouting. But in your photo sessions, once you have find the perfect place, I just you you can think this is the place where I can where I would like to do the the photo. Do you give absolute priority to get that perfect photo with the perfect light, or even you have find a place it's perfect to you? Do you like to run? to achieve more photos. How does Enrico Fossati work when he is already in the field and it's the time to take the pictures? No, well, I'm shooting more than one picture. I am usually, I'm not moving. I, I'm moving in, in the scene uh, uh, quite often because, well, it is possible that uh, when I find a, a spot, I, I wait there because I'm pretty sure that there aren't better options or maybe I need that foreground because I foresee maybe uh, a night shot or a composition with a different lighting. So maybe I have to wait that the light is changing on the foreground. So I have to, I have to keep the tripod in, in position. Otherwise, I love to, to move in the scene, especially uh, because I'm traveling to the, to the, to the Alps in the in, in summer and i start to to walk in, uh, in the early afternoon so when i am in 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 place i start to just to scout the scene with the phone i i drop my gear somewhere and then i start to 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 look with the phone some compositions and then i see the evolution of light because uh, as i told before sometimes the the light of the afternoon uh could be very very interesting i have many examples in my portfolio about this kind of lighting i have a question uh, from guillermo uh, that i already had uh, in my mind about the tripod do you do you, you always shoot with tripod or do you think that we must leave more times the tripod in the floor and shoot by with our hands do you think that perhaps we are too obsessed with shooting always with tripod in order to achieve the best detail, the no noise, etc. Well, the tripod is essential for a certain kind of shooting. For example, if you are shooting a focus stack or a kind of, we um, are, are using a kind of technique that you have to be absolutely precise. You need the, you need a bit, of course, but otherwise you can shoot handheld definitely, uh, especially with the new camera like. Uh, a7 or 4 or maybe Canon Mark 5 uh, all these kind of cameras they are are super super uh, flexible you can raise the ISO without compromising the quality so uh, I, I believe that shooting handle they is giving you a lot of chance and especially you can find better composition so I usually I invite my students to move in the field with the camera or just with the phone shooting handle and try to find a nice composition that may be in uh, normally with the with the weight of the tripod is more complicated yeah yeah uh, some people has asked that they, your website was not uh, working uh, i can tell all the audience that your uh, website is working fine it's working perfectly so there is no problem and by the way later we are going to talk about post processing but i want to remember uh, the, your followers that enrico has uh, given to us a discount code for all of their or all of his video tutorials with a 30% discount code it is uh, i'm am i right enrico yes it's 30 euros yes. and your tutorials are already translated to spanish uh, thanks to our friend uh, Javier de la Torre. Yes. Yes, yes. People was asking if you choose him because he was very handsome and tall. No, 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 no. He's not he's not handsome at all. No, no. It's 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 a troll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have more questions here. Uh, sorry because um, Antonio Marquez is asking to us if you could talk to your past which advices will you tell him? I mean, for my past about what? About I, my... I think I, I think it, the, the question is not well done. I think that he want to ask you if uh, if you can give some advice to your Enrico Fossati from today. 
Well, uh, <laughs> it's always uh, if you can if you can to, if you can to the if you go to the if you travel to the past, what advices uh, will you give your to your Enrico in hmm. the past? Well, probably I don't know. Uh, is with the time machine? Uh, it, yeah, it, it's always it's always nice to think of things that can make your life easier. But probably in terms of photography, uh, I think I I did the right choice for everything, and uh, maybe I could be um, spend more time in developing the commercial and and the, and the marketing uh, aspect of my of my business but besides that I'm always proud of everything I did and uh, I'm so happy about all the person that I met during my journey mm. in the world of photography people like uh, Javier de la Torre and all the mm. Spanish guys that I met during my trips yeah. to Spain in Asturias and uh, yeah. it has been a, a fantastic journey And do you think it's possible we, you are traveling to places where a lot of photographers go to take their pictures? Do you think it's possible to achieve different photos anywhere, even oh. on a famous location? It is always possible to find something with your own style? Oh, yes, no, totally. Uh, of course, it could be challenging because uh, yeah. if you walk in a place, if you are visiting a place that is very very famous uh, is always complicated to to avoid the classical compositions because are just perfect because maybe have been uh, um, i mean are something that are fixed in our mind but this is not like a, a way to say i have to do that so you have to to push uh in your efforts and trying to do something different especially well besides the composition but you can always try to develop that picture with your own personal style yeah. and uh trying to to make something that people can say okay this image is okay is that place but is a little different yeah uh i have a question about uh, your uh I think something that it's not very common in your images. It's, uh, in fact, I ha I think I haven't seen uh, still an image from you with a Milky Way or a Star Trials. You have really, I think you have really a little night photography, perhaps more uh, auroras or things like that, uh, but not too many uh, night uh, escapes. Are, it's something that you don't like or like Ryan Dyer, Like he said, he told to us, he's lazy and at night he likes to sleep. Well, uh, probably. Uh, well, there is. I like night photography because uh, it's giving you uh, incredible chances of doing different things. But you have to find the right subject. And um, when I'm when I usually travel to the mountains, especially during summer, the day is very long because uh, maybe you have to wake up very early in the morning because maybe sunrise during summer is quarter to five and then you have to wait until half past ten for shooting the sunset. So the day is very long and you have to choose what to do uh, if shooting the night or shooting the day. Uh, personally, I prefer shooting the, the day, but you know, just creative choice. But I like it, definitely. Yeah, I will surprise you one day with a uh, with the night performance. <laughs> We have a, a question related to night. Uh, Guillermo asked also to us that uh, lighting is your most important thing to you, as you have said. But how do you face landscape photography with noon light? Do you chat for noon light? Do you mean a landscape maybe during a rainy yeah, day? Yeah, per perhaps. Oh yeah, but the, the, that is the the reason of uh, why is born the dark processing. Yeah. Dark processing and mastering the mood is a workflow that is has been created to manage that kind of condition. So I introduce a sort of lighting in the landscape that is not barely a fake light, but is giving a dimension to the picture that is enjoyable. Hmm. 
you are speaking uh, very you are very very being very very I don't know how to sell. You are telling your real opinion about everything. So I want to ask you about the explosion of all kind of photo contests. We are living like I think uh, a lot of photo contests uh, are uh, are every day rising. So uh, do you think uh, perhaps you don't you don't pay too much uh, too much? What? No, we said photo contest. Yeah, are you talking about photo contest? Photo ah, contest. Oh, okay, photo contest. Sure. Uh, and you, like other fo great photographers, I think you don't pay too much attention to, to them. Don't you think that perhaps nowadays many of the photo contests are just a simple, a simple money grabber? Well, uh, this is a quite complicated discussion and uh, I'm not popular for my fair opinion about these kind of things. Probably I'm not the the nicer person in, in the web for talking about these kind of topics. But I have one thing that for me is precious that I'm honest and I am a polite person and I say what I think. So I believe that uh, photo contests nowadays are just a big business. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the goal of the, the most of this kind of competition is making money. Yeah. This is the reason why many competitions are plenty of awards. So there is, okay, the overall, and then there are thousands of badges. Uh, yeah. Like uh, best photographer in the midday, best photographer at night, best photographer yeah. in the North Pole, best photographer in the desert. So you have thousands of prizes and everybody are proud to show a PDF with no value on the web. And uh, because these guys are just making money with that, because most of these competition are charging you 25 or 30 euros for just one picture. And all the photographers I know at minimum are sending three or four or five pictures. So it's a lot of money considering that maybe they collect. Uh, images from like maybe 3,000, 5,000 people. And uh, well, I'm not uh, judging these people because they are entrepreneurs, but because are, I think they are not awarding the very best, in my opinion. And uh, I want to say also that sometimes I see a lack of proficiency in selecting images, probably uh, not because these people are not uh, professionals, but maybe are not landscape photographers. And this yeah. is makes a huge difference because uh, in the past I was uh, hired for, to be a judge in a, in a competition where the main team, it was portrait. I don't know nothing about portrait. It, it, it was very challenging for me yeah. trying to understand what was the very best. And uh, I think these people are um, just awarding what is catchy, what is commercial, what puppets your eyes, but they don't understand the true spirit of landscape photography. I not mean everybody in all the competition, but very often. I don't want yeah. to mention any competition, but yeah. uh, it's something that I see. This is yeah. the region. I this is the reason why I'm joining the competition only time to time. Just a, yeah. a ticket for the lottery. Uh, yeah. I, okay. yeah. <laughs> I, I try to play my 50 euros, but I have no hopes because this is what I'm doing is not commercial. In, in terms of music, I am considered like a kind of black metal of the photography. So. <laughs> Thank you very much for being so honest with all of us. And I agree with you. And that's also, also my, my opinion. I have shared sometimes that perhaps there are too many photo contests. And people, perhaps the, the photographic ego, I think all the photographers have some type of ego and it's difficult uh, not uh, resist and uh, avoiding to enter in some kind of content so uh, I, it was a, qu a question I want uh, I want to to ask you now uh, and talking about uh, talking about money uh, spending money you have a very very expensive gear I think you have Leica equipment but oh, we know that in, in your case 
you would do wonders with any camera. The important thing about your images, it's not the detail or the perfection of the lens, but the composition and the post-processing. Do you think that we, keep, do we, we become too obsessed with having full-frame cameras, always looking for perfect detail and as little noise as, as possible? Well, I, uh, well, just to let you know, I, I'm not anymore uh, um, in business with Leica. Ah, so, I, I I was talking tell, telling because it was in your in your yeah, website. No, I, I, yeah, my website is not updated, but I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not working with them, not anymore. Uh, it has been a personal choice because uh, it wasn't a problem or an issue about the gear because the camera, of course, it, it was great. But um, it was a kind of partnership that was not satisfying mm -hmm. me on the professional side. So mm -hmm. I decided to, to quit. And uh, actually, I sold my gear and I switched to Sony as a personal choice. I'm not working with Sony. I don't have any agreement. Probably I would not have any agreement anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, the main reason uh, of purchasing uh, an expensive gear is that if you feel that you are limited in in, in some way by your gear and um, honestly the medium quality of the cameras today is, yeah. is very high and uh, there isn't the brand that they can see uh, is not good uh, or maybe avoid this kind of camera because is not suitable for landscape landscape in terms of requirement it, i think is the less demanding uh, you don't need nothing special except if you're not shooting night photography so in that case maybe you have to move on a on a camera that is uh, is better with high iso but otherwise any camera is good and uh, any lens that is um, enough for the thing of composition or you have in mind that it is okay. I mean, um, you can grab uh, any of the Sigma lenses that their quality is astonishing. I mean, yeah. uh, I had for a while Leica lenses at home and I compared them with Sigma and Nikon lenses and the difference is minimal for what concerning the use for landscape photography because we never use this kind of lenses at a wide aperture. So when you're stopping down below F11 yeah. or, or more, you don't see any difference. So, yeah. Or, well, OK, uh, a professional lens, an expensive lens, uh, for example, uh, a 1224 F2.8 by Sony is definitely an expensive lens and the reason of why i'm purchasing that lens because he is flare free and the if i stop down at f16 maybe the diffraction is not so bad but this is the main differences but are not something that you can't take pictures without them so you have just to to take care when you are in the field to avoid certain things but of course for professional use a good gear is necessary, but it's not mandatory. You you don't have to to spend thousands of euros. Thousand. For your gear. I think it, it is more important spending for traveling. Yeah, tra traveling. I I always say the 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 better thing, the better way to spend the, your money in in the photography side is uh, to spend it on on journeys and also on video tutorials and on yes, and techniques definitely, and uh, definitely yeah. instruction is a good investment especially if you are if you spend like a, a huge amount of money for your gear and then you're not able to exploit it i think you need yeah. to, to invest a little in uh, in a training it, it has no sense yes and if you could only take one lens to a trip which lens would you choose nowadays only one lens yeah probably imagine you are you are, you are go imagine you are going like me this summer i am going with my family to the mountains and i have to go with uh, with some things with my children also i can only take one camera and one lens and you have you want to do pictures you don't know what you are going to do what would you choose hmm. 
probably I will bring with me um, if I'm going in the mountains, uh, probably 24, 105. 24? 105. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. So you prefer uh, prime lenses? No, I don't use primes. I no? probably use less for, for what I'm doing. I'm not. I use it for a while, the 2470 by Nikon F28. Mm -hmm. It was just heavy. Yeah. For me, probably it will be the, the 14, 24. But if I'm with my family, perhaps the 24, uh, 100, perhaps. Well, uh, depends. But it, I will choose the, 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 the lens the, according to the location, because if I know that there are places that are more suitable for wide angles, probably I will go for that. But otherwise, uh, I think uh, I know or a, a medium zoom would be perfect for me. Yeah. And what other things do you always carry in your backpack? Well, for me, uh, the essential things are besides batteries and uh, headlamp. Um, I always bring with me a polarizer mm -hmm. for, for the wide angle and also for, for the long lens. And uh, well, I bring with me an umbrella. A, a raincoat <laughs> um, umbrella yeah <laughs> yeah yeah this is part of my gear is essential for uh, certain kind of pictures and without without umbrella i uh, i wouldn't ever achieve certain pictures because it, it is essential because i'm able to just to stay a long time in in the, in the middle of the scene with the with the rain above my head uh, and just i i can focus my attention on the composition instead of uh, taking care about my camera that is soaking. Well, the past the past spring, my camera is fallen in the river. <laughs> <laughs> it, it has been crazy because uh, I was very worried about because this camera it was very expensive, and uh, I was uh, very worried about the gear. But then in the end, after a couple of days at home. Um, it was it was safe at the end. <laughs> so I, yeah, I, I was impressed about the weather ceiling of that camera. Uh, and after so many years, so many so many courses, trips, photos, do you still see this as a passion, or uh, it is more like a job for you? Or to be a landscape photographer, the passion, the the real love for photography, it's something that can be never be lost because otherwise. It will be noticeable in your images. Oh, totally. I think the the the, the key, at least for me, uh, is to to keep um, photography as a secondary job. Uh, my primary job is uh, IT professional, and mm -hmm. uh, I use photography as a side job. And uh, definitely, after so many years. Uh, uh, teaching and uh, creating videos sometimes could be a little um, not boring, but is committing because it is yeah. something that you are doing uh, not for for fun, but because you are doing something uh, as a professional. So the, the approach is is different compared different. when you are going with your friends taking mm. pictures. But uh, on the other end, I think the best. Uh, the best way to keep the the passion alive is to do exactly what you love. I know many professionals, for example, Erin Babnik, that she's working mm -hmm. with me. She is passionate about teaching, and she is running like uh, ten or fifteen workshop per year. And well, for me, it would be impossible. It's impossible uh, to do it. Yeah, yeah. For, it's... For, it's not. It's not for me. I, I like teaching, but uh, I can think to my ear scheduled every month, like one or two workshops. Wow. It, it's yeah. insane. But by the way, Erin Vatnik, incredible uh, female photographer. Uh, yesterday I talked with a friend that told, he told me that uh, he didn't know about uh, Erin Vatnik and it's an incredible uh, photographer that I deeply recommend everybody to, to follow because his work is it's outstanding. 
And speaking of courses, uh, you are a pioneer of the photographic training uh, of this fine art style that many of us have been trying to learn over the years. And in fact, uh, we talked with that about with Javier de la Torre some years ago, a lot of years ago, a group of the best known photographers in Spain hired you years ago uh, to a private workshop to learn those techniques. And in general, everybody in Spain, I remember myself, we all wanted to learn how to get those kind of photos. Nobody knew how to, to get those styles. And many of us learned from those people you already taught them. Do you think it's possible to continue surprising people with post-processing? Or today, everything is already invented. How do you see the, the evolution in the photographic training? Well, uh, this is a nice question. Uh, well, by the way, that trip, it was very funny. <laughs> and it, it uh, was the first, the first time you was in Spain, I think, perhaps. No, 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 no. Oh. I, I, oh. I was in Spain many times before because, oh. I, I, you know, I love Spain. I am, I'm always traveling to Spain for my vacations. And, uh, but I went to Spain the first time uh, as a professional for, uh, for training uh, for these guys. And um, um, about your question about the processing, uh, I think the evolution is continuous. Probably is changing because uh, like uh, 10 years ago, uh, YouTube was not as today and the, the amount of workshops available uh, now are countless. You can find uh, thousands of photographers selling uh, videos, presets, automations. The hugest difference that always you will have in the post-processing will be the difference between people that are just aiming to a wow effect and people that are trying to create something that is really artistic. So I don't use automations at all for my works. I always work with uh, manual instruments I'm doing a lot of burning and dodging and uh, a lot of fine tuning of my images. Everything is the manually. I, I, I never, I never use uh, like automations or plugins that are doing things uh, mm -hmm. automatically. Um, and uh, I Pro think pro the probably yeah. something like, like Ted Gore that all he, I remember to watch Gore video tutorials, he always do everything with uh, manually, like you, no plugins at all. Yes, and um, well, uh, probably uh, Ted, as many of the great photographers in, of the United States, are born as professional in the age where everything was made manual. And Alex. Uh, Ryan Dyer, Erin Babnik, all these professionals are working in that way. And I, I learned with them. So I can mm -hmm. talk about you a, a nice thing about uh, back in 2013. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I started to, to, to develop my personal style doing uh, this kind of editing. And I joined a group of photographers. Uh, on Facebook, it was like a kind of secret group. And this group mm -hmm. was named LPR 51. And it was composed by 51 photographers. And the, the founders of this group were Erin Babnik, Ted Gore, and Alex Noriega. And they started to to join, to, to understand, to work with this, as these people, because this was a criticism group. It wasn't like a social mm -hmm. group that I was posting just to receive, oh, wow, amazing, beautiful, you are an artist. That it was a group that you were posting and uh, all the people were commenting with pretty harsh criticism. So it wasn't mm -hmm. just uh, a way to be happy about our pictures, but was a place where to understand what are our flows and how to improve them, the brightness, the color, the composition, everything. Yeah. And everybody were nitpicking about this kind of flows because it was essential to be perfect in the execution and in the development of a picture that it was working. And 
I learned a lot, of course, and uh, it has been uh, very rewarding uh, on the long time because I think working manually is one of the few ways to keep your personal style distinctive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I call I think, uh, for, yeah. No, I think um, there are a lot of nice uh, shortcuts today, like uh, Luminar, a lot of presets from Lightroom, yeah. a lot of yeah. softwares that are making your life easier. But what are you doing? I think will will be more standard, uh, like uh, yeah. something that uh, when you when you do something like that, you see, OK, it's nice, but I feel that I already see something like that. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. That, that people of yeah. Tech will. People, people was also asking in the chat about that question, like a sky replacement from IE, AI tools like Luminar and, and things like that. Uh, about your opinion about this kind of, uh, of tools? Well, the, the sky replacement, uh, it, I think it's not something that uh, it makes me, uh, I mean, scandalized about these kind of things because it could be part of the creative process. I'm not doing that very often. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to 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 exploit the the natural sky, but I did it sometimes, not completely. Maybe I created a patch of clouds where there was maybe mm -hmm. something that it wasn't. Maybe you have a, a patch of blue sky in a, in an area that it it wasn't nice. So maybe I I I try to change it. Um, painting over and uh, I think that is, is perfectly fine for me except except if the sky becomes the subject of the, of the of the of the picture for example if you are shooting uh, a normal place and then you're pasting a sky of a special uh, weather phenomenon uh, that is in my opinion has no sense mm -hmm. for example uh, if you are just uh, if the subject of your pictures are uh, lenticular clouds, mm -hmm. in my opinion, is something that uh, is weird. I mean, uh, why you have to do that? I mean, you should you should try to improve your images, creating a patch or maybe replacing part of the color, or you can make some adjustment. But just replacing the sky to make it more wow, well, I don't know. Yeah, perhaps perhaps your your portfolio it is the it's a perfect example to in, in order to people to see that your images they don't need the perfect sky they are are masterpieces because of the of the treatment of the light and they don't need anything else uh, they are perfect in composition and in the shadows the light it's everything is perfect and they don't need anything else so i always uh, uh, i also want to ask you about your post processing how long does it take on average to you to post process a picture hmm. depends it depends uh, if it is a complicated image uh, sometimes it could take more time or maybe a it's not very rare that I, I reprocess the same picture multiple times because maybe I'm not satisfied. Uh, there are moments of the year that you're not inspired and you're not able to process it in the right way. Yeah. And there are nights that just wait one second, you make it perfect. Yeah. I think yeah. it's also good for people to know that everybody, even a master like you, sometimes it's not able to achieve what he wants in a in a picture because as you have said you are not you are not inspired and you have to give you some time it's it's not always easy to to know what to do at, to an image no it's not the matter of what to do maybe i have it clearly in my mind because usually uh, when i take a picture i always trying to think how to process that picture and how to to make it interesting for my portfolio. But there are days that you, I don't know how to explain, you're not just in the right mood to to process yeah. it in, in the proper way. Maybe you are a little tired 
and maybe you are contrasting your images too much or the saturation is not okay or a lot of things and uh, i think a very a true creative especially if you are doing an artistic job on your picture that it means doing everything manually uh, you need to be inspired and what are you doing is just the fruit of uh, your life i mean uh, you need to be fine with yourself and uh, you need to to make your own experience you have to to live your own meet your friends and living your emotions traveling uh, you can't just stay at home thinking how to make more likes and followers. You have just to to breathe, to feed your creativity. Yeah. And then when you wake up the right morning and then you start to process and your image will be perfect. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And as you have said, you you don't you are you are always doing always uh, everything manually. So for you, you only need you only use Photoshop perhaps and luminosity mask, nothing else. No, I'm using other plugins, but usually uh, I I apply them with the luminosity masking just to um, to those certain things. For example, maybe colorize from color effects mm. that is very useful to creating uh, a color cast on the image or yeah. maybe a detail extractor. I'm doing this because are speeding up my workflow, but I could avoid them. Yeah, yeah. Per perhaps it is necessary because color effects is the plugin that uh, I think most of us are always using. Perhaps just two or three uh, filters b uh, inside of color effects to put uh, to to give a cast, a color cast. But it is necessary to be able to do it by your own, not depending of the software. Oh yes, the key. That is the key. Uh, it, it is essential to to be able to be independent by these kind of things because color effects has been discontinued already one time. So yeah. if one day uh, the yeah. XO want to uh, commit this kind of pitch, this kind of software, you have to be independent by that. In fact, it was uh, just about to happen because four years ago, when it was a, a free plugin, it was dead, and people was asking what going what do what I'm going to do if I don't know how to do the Orton or some things or the color cast or the glamour glow if I don't know how to do it, and people was very worried. I didn't remember. I remember four or five years ago about that, and yeah, yeah, I sure. Haven't... That 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 is is a good point. In fact. Uh, besides the start to finish, that the, is the kind of video tutorials that I'm selling and uh, most of the photographers are, mm -hmm. uh, are selling. It is essential to study Photoshop as a software itself separated by the final result. So you should mm -hmm. purchase a, a course and the training that to understand the instruments and the tools inside Photoshop to be uh, able to use the, the software at 100 percent because mm -hmm. if you are not able to understand how to create a channel how to create a subtraction of channels or mixing the channels or creating a, a clipping mask or something like that i think it worth to spend a little of time investing some money in a course for example linda.com is doing a lot of uh, training about the software itself and are definitely very useful, especially if you're aiming to improve your skills in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And talking about post-processing, uh, I think you had already prepared uh, some of your of your PS files in order to 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 show uh, the people in the chat and people who will be watching this stream that it is always be going to be uh, in YouTube in the YouTube channel. Uh, what you can achieve with the post processing. So uh, if you want to share your screen. Yes, of course. Yeah. Just what you tell me, I can share. Yes, okay. One second. Yeah. Okay, I think. Uh, 
I think we can we can share it. Yeah. Yeah, where you are, we are watching your screen already. Okay, perfect. So this is <laughs> the major I was talking about before. This is uh, yeah. major, uh, Dash and Rivendell. And as you can see, this scene when I when I was in the cave, I was completely mesmerized by this condition because I was uh, looking at these beautiful stormy clouds and. Uh, as you can see, these kind of uh, clouds are so interesting, but the, the, the image itself, it was very dark and not exactly pleasing. I mean, uh, it's hard to to make to, to, to enjoy this picture naturally. These are the raw files. So with thanks to my processing, I started to to improve the quality. First of all, mixing the, the two kind of clouds to make the composition more interesting, especially in this point, because I was aiming to uh, reveal the details of, of the waterfalls here. And uh, the problem here, it was to create a transition uh, to draw the eye to the focal point that was these clouds that it was forming like a sort of uh, tunnel in, in, in the valley. So, uh i started to improve the lighting here just uh blending uh a brighter version of the raw file and then i started to improve the luminosity and then after i started to improve the details in the background here as you can see i painted some details this is before, this is yeah. after, and this is made manually. And, uh, uh, and all the steps are described in the video, and you can yeah. see every single brushstroke. <laughs> and uh, then I, I did the same with the detail in the foreground to improve the lighting here on the leaves and in all these meadows. And then uh, after I try, I use the, the color effects to, to create the cast and to make mm -hmm. the color more vibrant because there is a, a tool that I'm using quite often that I invite everybody to study a little more in deep the color of the scenes, just analyzing them. For example, um, there is an the instrument that is the um, Adobe Color Wheel that is a, it's a free instrument and yep. I, I use it very often to understand uh, the potential of an image besides understanding the analogs, monochromatic, triadic, complementary colors mm -hmm. that, in my opinion, complementary colors are fine but are not perfect for the kind of photography I have in mind because I'm looking for a cinematic as aspect of photography. Mm. So usually in the scene of the movies, the color schemes are uh, analogs. So are yeah. all similar colors that are mm, very, very similar. And this is the reason why uh, is it is important to understand this kind of things about the potential of the colors in an image and to understand it. I always invite you to analyze the image that you're looking for. For example, mm -hmm. if I wanted to uh, maybe getting inspired by a painting <laughs> by Albert yeah. Pierce, it is one of my spiritual masters. For mm -hmm. example, I download the image to my desktop. And then once I have the image on my desktop, uh, mm -hmm. I'm going back on the color wheel and then going to extract the theme. And this is a very powerful tool because I'm able to understand what color it used. And as you can see here, there is a clear transition. That is a dark to bright, starting from here, that is very dark and moving towards the light. Okay. And uh, you can save these themes uh, and you can pick the color and use them in Photoshop to be try to make a test and do or to create a color cast. 
Yeah. And they're returning to Photoshop after the, the, the toning that obviously is inspired by something that I stole. Excuse me, Rio. If you can do the, the image a bit high, a bit, uh, yes. yes, a bit of thumb. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Uh, I mean, after I uh, created the cast, because this cast probably it was inspired by something that I saw, maybe a movie or an illustration. And then I added the source of light. As you can see here, this is on and off. And then I continue to improve the lighting in the scene to make it more interesting. And then a little of darkening. The, the darkening is just a, a sort of custom um, bagnetting. And then moving forward, I added some lighting and then refined all the elements until the final image. Mm -hmm. And then in my video, you can see other images like this one. So in, in this video, I can show you how to turn a normal image to a night image with this yeah. special kind of atmosphere. I, and I really love this, this picture. This, uh, it's incredible, the mood. And I, uh, this composition and the place, it's incredible. Everything is explained step by step. You can see the before and after on my website. Yes, we can remember people that the, the, the discount code, the 30% 30, 30 discount code is just for one week. It's, it's right? Yes, yes, for the whole yeah. week. And uh, if I'm going to Spanish, you can see exactly the process from a normal image to this final version that is bluish with all this light painted step by step. And then always also you can see that the entire process of this image. So the, 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 the blending of these three steps and the creation of the light. And uh, let me check if I have the raw file so I can, I can show you something. Uh, oh, here I have also this, this, there is also explained the entire process of this image on the video. So you can, you start from this image that is really flat with yeah. uh, uh, a lighting that is not exactly interesting. And uh, I move toward the various step. First of all, the composition and the blending of the elements that are not perfectly fitting the needs of my composition. And then after the final blending, I start to improve the foreground and then creating a lighting. And then with color effects, creating a tones and then the darkening and all the light steps to creating the light more interesting and more cinematic. Until... And, a, and a realistic, realistic light. Yeah, that, that's, that is the key. Uh, it's important to moving step by step and uh, adding the, the light in the, in the proper way. And mm -hmm. let me check if I have also the, the last file. Do you shoot always with your with the final post processing in your mind? Yes, very often. Sometimes not because sometimes maybe I have an idea after when I am at home because I spend so much time in uh, in analyzing the raw files and then maybe I have an idea later. But usually I start to pre visualize this when I am uh, in the field. I'm trying to open this. That should be the, the Dragon Nest. That is a popular mountain location in uh, in, the, in northern Italy. That has been uh, quite popular in the last years after the release of this shot. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful mountain and the hike is not very challenging. So definitely it is a good compromise between uh, a hike uh, and the place where to took a spectacular image, mm. especially if you are traveling and you're not living in the area. Because sometimes certain locations are a little more complicated because you have to find them. Maybe you have to sleep in the area with the tent or maybe in a mountain hut. This, this yeah. place is definitely easier 
to to find and the hike uh, is not demanding so in in half an hour uh, 45 minutes you can reach mm -hmm. the the vantage point so this is the final image and i'm going to deselect all the layers just to show you then the, all the steps that are so many so this is the foreground and then the creation of the light this is the the other image with the with the dark clouds and if here, you can make a, a bit of zoom yeah sure yeah, perfect 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 and here are all the steps to to make the blending working so here are all the adjustments and the colorize this is probably the most complicated in the video because mm -hmm. you have a lot of options uh, and a lot of uh, layers about dodging and burning and creating the light. Incredible the light. Wow. Yeah. Everything is explained step by step. And then here you have all the, the steps to make the light more real and less artificial and all the details to the final image. Yeah, it's incredible the, the the change in the in the in the light and and a real and a real light. It's it's awesome. It's awesome. Thank do you, you have a lot? Do you do you have a lot of your some? Im How many images do you have printed by yourself from yourself in your house? Do you print? Oh, you yeah, 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 many. Yes. Uh, um, I'm not printing very often, but I, I'm loving to do that. Uh, I think in my home I have at least ten images I printed them. Yeah, on the stairs in my bedroom, uh, I like them. And uh, well, sometimes uh, it's also useful to understand your evolution. Maybe after yeah. some years that you see a picture printed on the wall and you start to see, mm. <laughs> now it's that's my case. That's my case. <laughs> as I was able to do in the past. That's my case. I have a. Uh, uh... Uh, an image in my in this room that I always put out when I'm going to record a video. I always put out <laughs> on Sunday. I think I will throw it to the to the to the garbage. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. sure. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Enrico, for showing us showing us your video tutorials. Uh, you know, people that we have talked about the uh, about the discount code thirty percent just for one week and you can buy also in english or in spanish or italian so yes. our followers are mainly from spain but this uh, this uh, stream will also be translated subtitled embedded to other languages so i hope people from italia for Ita for Ita from italy and other places will be seen also uh, do you usually work in pro photo it's oh, asking to us, David Moya. Yeah. Yes, always. You have a an ASO or similar, I think, monitor, uh, a, prof I, a professional uh, monitor. Yes, I am using a NEC multi-sync PA uh, 32 inch. is a Spectra View monitor. is a professional grade monitor, and I love it. it it's just perfect for for me needs. And. We are going with the final questions as we don't have to, want to take too much time to Enrico, his valuable time. And today it's a, it's a, it's night and people has to rest. But oh, uh, no what what excuse me? Oh, I mean there is no problem. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what do you think about the the amphitheaters? Because you have uh, entered into the amphitheaters market. How do you all, how do you how it's your experience with the MVT with all of the madness uh, running in Twitter and everything related? Well, the NFT space difficult difficult, qu difficult question. <laughs> difficult question. No, there really is not difficult because I'm still in the space and um, I think is the is the evolution of the is the future of the mar the the art market of photography. And uh, I think uh, is a great opportunity for creatives in general, not only photographers, but video makers, musicians, and any, any form of art. And um, the problem of the space nowadays is to find customers because the, of course there are millions of 
dollars that are uh, available in the space. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the problem is to connect with collectors. Um, the, the problem is that uh, the actual collectors are mainly traders, so are not uh, exactly interested to art. And mm -hmm. uh, yes. you have to understand that um, to make them more interested in your work, you have to create a strategy, a strategy to create profit. And uh, this is the key why certain persons in the space, they, they have gained like millions. I'm not, I'm not saying millions to use, a, a, I don't know what, how to say in English, but I, mm -hmm. I think you, you got the, the message. I mean, they gained real millions. And for me, it has been a positive experience because um, in one year, I gained more money selling <laughs> NFTs uh, in uh, than in, in my entire life with prints, that is sure. But I was lucky because the, the past summer when I joined the space, there was um, a whale. What the what in in, in this yeah. letter of, of the of the Twitter is, is called the whale. It was a, a huge collector with uh, an enormous amount of money, and I was able to i uh, was lucky it was just lucky and he collected two of my pieces and and then i continued to to share and trying to sell my work but is so so challenging uh, i invite everybody to join the space because it definitely is the future of the art market of photography but uh, is very time consuming and uh, I think the space is a little bit toxic because maybe you can push your efforts and sharing every day your works uh, and then maybe you see pictures that are not exactly good that they are they are sold for many money and then you see one my picture are not good and then you start to to think uh, I'm not anymore inspired I have to change uh, okay these kind of things are exactly normal but are one of the things you have to avoid to do in the space so you have to just to keep your nerves uh yeah relaxed uh, and patient what are you doing sharing your works uh, and uh, i believe that in, in the near future there will be an opportunity for everybody especially because all the big social media like 500 pix instagram facebook everybody are going to join the nft space yeah 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 and is there any place you want to go uh, to visit is there any place oh, yeah. you want especially want to to travel in order to take pictures do you have oh, yeah. any dream probably uh one of the, the the trips that i want to to do is new zealand yeah I would love to spend uh, some time, especially in the Fjordland. And then uh, I want to return to Canada because there are so many places there, especially Vancouver, uh, in the north, the Yukon, or maybe Alaska. All these places are just mind blowing. And definitely I want to visit them, but also I would like to visit Patagonia that I've never been. but. Yeah. But it is a super commercial place, but I want to, I would, I want to visit that place, and I wanted to try to make my own picture of that place. Three photo, there are three fro photographers from Spain. I really hate right now. They have been for a half, a one month and a half in Atacama and Patagonia all the day, sharing the stories. I really hate Pablo Ruiz. Felipe Soto and David Aguilar, I really, really hate them because it has been horrible. And talking about horrible things, let me ask you a funny question. I think you already know this man who is in the in in <laughs> yeah. this uh, this man called Antonio Prado. You, I know you shared uh, a whole trip to Iceland with him and Javier de la Torre. Was yeah. it easy? Was it easy to 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 stand with this man for? A week for a week because it's how did you manage 
to not to kill him all the day blogging like <laughs> in, in in front of you there it was i i did a a, a a gif some years ago where you was asking him to to move or your frame <laughs> and he was making a, a, a stream <laughs> <laughs> i don't remember exactly <laughs> the yeah. episode, but I, I, I was probably uh, I survived to use blocks because I wasn't able to understand exactly what he was <laughs> saying. Because I understand a bit the Spanish, but he was speaking so fast and, <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. He speaks he speaks very fast like me, like me, <laughs> like me. And I, in fact, uh, it's true. I did a, a little gift I lost because the it was a five or five or six years ago. I don't, I don't remember. But you were behind uh, uh, Kirk Eiffel, I think you were making a picture uh, lie in the in the snow or in the ice, and you were taking a picture with uh, the foreground, and he was just in the middle of your frame uh, uh, with with the, with the crampons and <laughs> it was, and talking to the camera, and you were making him, and it was in the it was already in the gif, and I make a gif of that moment you making do like this. <laughs> It was, but I lost it. I I have tried to find it, but I lost it. <laughs> uh, people, it's asking Paco Mercado if your uh, video tutorials are in Spanish. Yes, they are already not not just uh, subtitled, but also uh, in Spanish, translated to Spanish by Javier de la Torre. So yes, the question it's yes, and I'm going with the with the final with the final questions. Uh, I have uh, another for you. Um, do you th what do you think when somebody tries to make just the same image to you, or he tries the same image, the same composition, the same style? Do you like it or or or, or don't or you don't? Well, another interesting question. Uh... Nowadays, the, of course, the social media are just a factory of copycat works. So you can see the yeah. copy of the copy of the copy of the copy. And uh, in my opinion, there is nothing bad if it's made by a, an amateur photographer. I mean, if I purchase a, a video or I love mm, a place that has been captured by my favorite photography, photographer, I'm going there, I'm taking the picture exactly as him, and I'm tagging him like uh, I was inspired by Ivan to take this picture. I would say, oh, this is awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. When a professional is going in the place in trying to steal your ideas, steal your mood, or just to mimic your work, that makes me upset. And mm -hmm. it's happened many times in the, in the last years. And I hope this will not happen again. But uh, that is killing uh, the business. And uh, not because I'm losing money, but I think uh, in terms of professionalism, you have to be quite keen in creating something that is personal especially if you want to be perceived by people as a serious professional. Because, of course, there are images that have been taken by other persons and that I, I love them. And uh, I said, wow, this image is very nice, but I never uh, think to go there and to take exactly the same image. Uh, maybe I can visit the same place, but I want to try to take my own picture. In that fact, I, yeah. the proper approach that, in my opinion, should be taken in in the to have respect from other photographers. In fact, I really I, I always say that uh, everybody is always inspired by others, and sometimes I have made uh, an image really inspired by somebody with a very close composition or just the same. But I always say that uh, it's always good that when you do something clearly inspired by something to always tag him to always say hey i was inspired by him so thank you uh, and i always say that that's something that uh, un unfortunately not everybody does on social media no but the point is um exactly as a 
I'm, I'm always doing this example of the world of music. Uh, for example, uh, I am a, an amateur and I'm purchasing a guitar. Maybe I'm trying to mimic uh, the, the song of my favorite uh, band and that is perfectly fine. And at the same time, I'm doing that as a professional, uh, that, that it sucks. Uh, I think it's part of the creative process and uh, visiting a place uh, and trying to, to mimic a professional definitely is a good exercise for an amateur, but that should be just an exercise. So you don't have to think to build a portfolio on that because uh, simply it's not serious. And I mm. think in the end, your portfolio will be just um, a copy of the work of another person. Yeah. And uh, you'll never be noticed or uh, be famous for that. Just yeah. maybe you can collect a lot of followers because uh, they are already saying that they are already following other persons that aren't doing that kind mm -hmm. of pictures, but you will be just one of the many. Mm -hmm. And the last question I have for you, uh... It's a colleague talking about, profession, about professionals. Uh, a professional photographer uh, told me some, some months ago that for him, the boom of online video tutorials, the online training, it was uh, reaching, it, it was ending and that people interest is falling. Do you think uh, this is true or it's just that uh, there are too many people sharing online video tutorials and if you are not really good, Nowadays, it's very difficult to, to get clients. No, it's, it's not a matter of uh, finding clients, but uh, probably uh, jumping in that business right now is complicated because you have to prove to the world that you are teaching something that is different. And uh, everybody are aware about the, the classical techniques, for example, focus stacking, perspective planning, and uh, all these kind of techniques have been shared by thousands of American photographers and Europeans. So the key is not to sharing a video about uh, uh, something that is extremely technical, but you have to teach something that is just an approach, is not is an idea, and exactly as Mark Adams did with his yeah. workshops and his videos. So you have to transmit something that is exciting and is inspiring for people. And probably if you are just making a video about how to do a thing that it has been already so thousands of time uh, is not anymore mm. uh, profitable. And um, probably the market is, uh, is ending. I mean, as a professional, you can create a video time to time, but you can't think to do only that because mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're limiting yourself to landscape photography, maybe if you are doing different genre of photography, you can teach different techniques for doing other things. For example, wildlife or other kind of photography, but probably as a professional landscape photographer, your workflow in the years it will be always the same okay you can improve things you can improve aspect but you can't expect to sell videos exactly as the first time because it's impossible yeah but depends depends by the contents as i told you before so you have yeah. to share something that is not only technical you have to share something that makes people interested and excited to watch your video yeah. I think everybody here already know how to make uh, a Norton effects or, or a glow, yeah. or things like that. So you have just to be something new, you... new or simply interesting. You have to create yeah. interest around your work and uh, your idea of landscape photography. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enrico. Uh, it has been for me a real pleasure. It has been a a uh, long stream. We have been almost here for two hours. Uh, for me, I must say that it has been a really a dream, not just a pleasure, just uh, but also a dream, because you have been always all, uh, yeah. a reference to me. I'm uh, one of the great masters with Ryan Dyer, and for me, it's a dream having been able to to share this time with you, and also that people 
is able to 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 know the real Enrico Fossati, not just the images. So thank you, thank you very much, and I hope everybody will know the value the value of a, of, the, of a stream like like this with you. Thank you very much, Enrico. Thanks to you, Ivan. Uh, it has been a pleasure also to me, and thanks to all the Spanish guys that have joined me tonight. I'm sorry, but I'm not speaking at this in Spanish. I'm, I, mm. I know only a few words and not yeah. exactly good, but this is the blame of Javier de la Torre that he told me yeah. all the bad words. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I hope we can meet up somewhere. Probably, well, it should be, should be nice to meet up in Patagonia with Javier de la Torre. Yes. Yeah. If not, perhaps we will be, we will find you in in Asturias or Spain in the north, as you like a lot the the north. Oh of Spain. yeah, <laughs> I, I would love to return uh, in in Asturias. Uh, I had such good moments there, and I am also a good friend, and so I will return with with a great pleasure. So we we wait for you here in this, in Spain, Enrico. Thank you very much, and thank you everybody. And have a, have a nice week. Goodbye. Thank you very Bye. much.